Hashing is a method of storing passwords that's more secure than simply storing them in plain text. However, depending on the developer, they might use a hashing algorithm like SHA-1. Now, SHA-1 is perfectly good for doing things like verifying that a downloaded file is the one that you meant to download. However, for doing things like storing passwords, it's actually pretty terrible. We'll show you how easy it is to brute force a SHA-1 hash by building your own Python 3 tool in this episode of Cyber Weapons Lab. Encryption and hashing are different because they solve fundamentally different problems. Encryption has the goal of eventually recovering data that's been hidden, whereas hashing is more like a check system or to make sure that something hasn't been modified in transit. Now this is useful if you're, for example, downloading a file and you want to make sure that nothing's been changed, because the way a hash like SHA-1 works is by taking a file and by 512-bit chunks, running a loop that basically adds a value to an internal state and at the end of the function produces a 160-bit hash value that can't be reversed but can be validated with the same seed. So that means you can do certain things like making sure that the same file always produces the same result because a single bit changing will cause a cascade effect and eventually at the end produce a very different value. Now this is great in some ways because, unfortunately, while not all hashes are equal, some are specifically meant for hashing things like passwords, and like bcrypt is able to produce different values each time you put in the same seed. That makes it resistant to brute forcing attacks, which unfortunately faster uh, hashes like SHA-1 are vulnerable to, which we can show off with a little bit of Python code. To show you why this is a problem, I started this Python program to show the difference between the way that SHA-1, MD5, and bcrypt encrypt, or rather hash, an input that we give it. Now, using the password nullbyte, I can supply it here and see that SHA-1 and MD5 both uh, hash it to the exact same hash value. Now, what's a problem about that is I can use a password list to create a hash value of a bunch of different guesses and compare it directly to the value that SHA-1 or MD5 would produce. Because of this, SHA-1 and MD5 are best suited towards things like maybe downloading a file and making sure that nothing has been changed. Because if even one bit is changed in the file that is used as the seed, the ending SHA value or MD5 value will look completely different. But unfortunately, because it produces the same value each time, it's relatively easy to brute force. Now the last result you can see is the bcrypt. And bcrypt has used what's called a random salt in order to make sure that each one of these looks very different, and these hash strings won't be able to be compared directly against each other. That means if I were to hash a whole bunch of passwords that I thought the, this might be and compare them directly, they wouldn't match. Now, the vulnerability with MD5 and SHA-1 can be exploited pretty easily, and today we'll show you how this can be done using a Python 3 program to brute force a SHA-1 hash. Now, in order to write pretty much any kind of program, you're going to need to put together a list of steps that are basically a series of actions your program will need to take in order to achieve its objective. In our case, we want to try to crack a hash, so our first piece of pseudocode will be to request a hash to crack from the user. Our second piece of pseudocode will be to find a password file and open it, which will contain a list, maybe 10,000 or so, of passwords that have been collected as just being very common or very bad passwords. Our third step is going to be to take a specific password guess from that password list and pass it into our fourth step, which will hash it so we can compare it directly against the hash from the first step. And our fifth step will actually make that comparison, and based on the outcome of that, we'll move on to our sixth step, which will be a conditional statement that tells us what will happen if we find a match or if we don't find a match. Now if we do find a match, we'll simply print the password that was successful. But if we don't, we'll jump back up to the third step, which is to request a new guess from the password file, and then move back down through the cycle again. Now if we get all the way to the end of the file and we don't find anything, we'll do our seventh step, which is to simply print match not found. Now I've already written this code, and the logic is pretty simple, so let's jump in. So I've taken this Python code and I've condensed it to about 11 lines. Now I could take it a little bit further, but unfortunately that would make it really difficult to read. So since this tutorial is more for beginners to understand how this works, I want to keep it readable. Now if you want to get this code for yourself, you can head on over to the GitHub page 
at this link here, which we'll include in the description. And you can clone or download by clicking here, copying this address and going to a terminal window and simply running git clone and then that link there. So that'll go ahead and download everything and you can type cd some bytes and ls to see all the files and you'll see right there all the different versions of the file that you can poke around with yourself. Now you should probably do this in an IDE which is an integrated development environment and in particular we recommend PyCharm. So PyCharm is great and you can see it's at jetbrains.com slash PyCharm and if you're a student in particular you can get the pro version for free which is really fun and awesome. So let's jump into PyCharm and we'll have the file open and again, you can download that and open it so you'll see the same thing here. And we'll actually go into the version that we wrote that has comments so we can go a little bit more into depth as to what's actually happening in each line of code. Now, Python is a really simple language and it's a lot of fun because in general, you can do some stuff that's a little bit rough and Python will just kind of roll with it. Whereas other languages that are more strongly typed like uh, C++ will throw an exception if you don't do things like define a variable or something first. So again, we broke this out already, but the first step of what we're going to do is to get a hash from the user that we're going to attempt to crack with this program. So here we can use the input function, which we enclose with parentheses, and inside here we can say what we want the prompt to say. Now as soon as the user puts something in response to this when our program runs, that'll be saved into this variable here, which is going to be a text string, which is called SHA1Hash. Now if we run our program, we can see we get a prompt that says, please input the hash to crack. So that's great. We've cleared step one, and as soon as I type that in, it'll put that value into the SHA1 hash variable. Now second, we'll need to open a file full of password guesses. Now we can do that by finding a URL. In this case, I chose to pick something rather than a local file, uh, something that would work on everyone's computer. And in this case, we're just using a GitHub link to a list of uh, 10,000 uh, most common passwords. So when we're doing this, we're going to use a module called uh, URL open, and we'll need to import this in the beginning in order for this to work. Now later, we'll also use a module called hashlib. So in the very beginning of our file, we'll need to type for, uh, oh sorry, from uh, URL lib dot request import URL open, because that's what we'll be using, and uh, comma hashlib, because we'll be importing that whole library. Now that is actually available by default in most installations of Python, so we won't need to do anything special. But in general, if this doesn't run on your computer because it says it doesn't have URL lib, you can go ahead and run the installation file as is described in the GitHub page. So back to this, as soon as we open this list of common passwords, we're going to put it in this variable called list of common passwords, and it'll be saved as a string. So it's also a UTF-8 or text file, so we'll need to include that information right here, otherwise this URL open function won't know how to encode it when it's passing it to the list of common passwords. Now the third step we're going to do is to take a guess from that list of passwords that we have opened and split it up line by line. Now we can use the backslash n, which is the new line symbol, to figure out where each new line is, and we can just use this for loop, which is for guess in list of common passwords dot split, to basically tell the program that we want to run it for the length of the list, and then split each guess by the new line um, character. So what that means is that guess is going to be everything up to the new line character each time we run through this loop. So the first password guess will be stored into the guess variable. So great, we've now taken a guess out of this big list of 10,000 passwords and we put one of those guesses into the guess variable. So next, the fourth step, we'll need to hash this so that we can compare it to the hash that the user gave us in the first step. So this is indented because it's part of the for loop here. And that's how we tell Python it belongs to this for loop. And the uh, hashed guess variable, which is what we want, is going to be a basically a result of this guess being hashed with the SHA1 function. So this is uh, the hash library dot SHA1 will convert uh, right here, this guess into a SHA-1 object. So finally, this last part right here is the hexadigest. Uh, so what that will do is, hexadigest, 
So that'll actually give us the current digest or the current value of this SHA function. Cause we could actually keep feeding it more values and we could keep adding stuff to it, but this will print the current value. So what we're saying here is go ahead and take the bytes version because this won't take a string. And those are different data types in Python where bytes is just the literal bytes and a string is an interpreted version. So we'll take the literal bytes version, hash it with this function right here, and then we'll print out the, the current value of that hash. So the result of all this goes into the hashed guess variable. And now we have a hashed version of that guess that we just pulled from this list of passwords. Next, we will add uh, a comparative statement that will compare the hashed guess to the original variable that we got at the beginning from the user. So whatever hash that they gave us, we're gonna compare it against the current uh, guess hashed, which we did in the last step. And we're gonna say in the next step, the sixth step, that if they match, we're going to print the password is and then whatever the current guess is. Not the hash version, the actual plain text, just password. So that'll be nice for the user. They'll just see something that says the password is uh, password123. And then we'll quit because we don't need to run anymore if we've already gotten the password. Now we'll use this elif, which actually means else if. So we'll say uh, if the hash guess does not, which is the crunch uh, symbol right here, the exclamation point and then the um, equal sign. Uh, so if it does not equal the original hash the user gave us, we'll print password guess and then the guess does not match, trying next. And then we'll jump back up to step three where we'll take another guess from the password list and we'll replace the, the password in the variable guess with a new uh, password from this list. Now, if we get all the way through this, then we will go to the seventh and final step, which is where we'll tell the program that we wanna print password not in database, we'll get them next time. So we can run this and let's say that we have a hash we know is not gonna be right. We'll put in a hash that's not even a hash. So here we go, that's, that's not a hash. We'll run it and see what our program does. It's going to, oh, it tried 10,000 different passwords very quickly and then password not in database, we'll get them next time. So let's try something valid and see if we can get it to work. So I wrote this little helper program in order to create SHA-1, uh, SHA, yeah, SHA-1, MD5, and bcrypt hashes of different password inputs. So by running it, let's say we want uh, matrix to be the password. We can grab the SHA-1 hash of matrix right here, and we can put it into our program and run it. And when we input this hash here, it'll try 10,000 times or however many times it takes to find it. And the password is matrix. We can see this line right here is being executed because hash guess equals SHA-1 hash, which is what we got from the user. So this is a very simple piece of Python and it's pretty easy to get started building things like this. We even took it a step further and we condensed it down to like three lines or so, three, four lines, because you can use some things like uh, the ternary operator to condense expressions and do some other things to make it trickier and smaller. But in general, this is kind of bad practice because for somebody who's looking at your code or trying to build on it or figure out how it works or, or solve an error, it makes it really difficult for them to understand what's going on. So the condensed version of the code we just walked through looks like this. It's a tight little 11 lines of code. And it's cool because this little uh, collection of code can run through 10,000 or if you wanted to, up to 10 million uh, from the same GitHub repository, uh, 10 million different password guesses and run them against any SHA-1 hash you encounter. Now, if you wanted to add to this code, it's very easy because you could do something like this and just add the ability to uh, brute force MD5 hashes as well. Now, as you can see from running the example, uh, you can't do the same with a bcrypt hash because all these hashes are different. So if you're a developer, you should take note that it's very easy to continue doing this sort of thing with any hash that produces the same value. And uh, that represents a pretty serious problem. So if you want to jump in and play with some Python, you can add all sorts of functionality to the script that we've created. So download it, modify it, and if you do something really cool, like maybe taking a whole directory of hashes and cracking them against a bunch of options, then we wanna see it. Go ahead and post it in the comments, and if you create something cool, we'll give you a shout out in the next episode. Python is a simple but powerful language that allows you to easily create your own tools. And in this case, you can take the script that's been built so far and expand on it to be able to do things like crack an entire list of hashes at once.
Now, if you're a developer, you should realize that using SHA-1 or other fast hashing mechanisms isn't usually the best way to go. Instead, you should use something like bcrypt, which is deliberately designed to be slow. This is important because if you're looking to prevent against a brute force attack like the one we just performed, a slower hashing algorithm is actually better because it won't affect the one or two times you have to hash it to log someone in, but it will make an attack like this so slow that it's not practical. That's all we have for this episode. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll see you next time.